Many consider Steam to be the best PC launcher out there, but why? As you know, nothing is born perfect, and Steam wasn't born perfect either. But of course, Steam has seen 20 years of improvement. Steam was released on September the 12th, 2023. Before Steam existed, patching your PC titles was the wild wild west. You had to download and install the patches from the developer's website over your own game install. And because a lot of games back then didn't have an automated patching system, there was no way to guarantee people got patches. But Valve saw a clear need for this for their titles, such as Counter-Strike. As you know, Steam was the first step towards that, and it's a piece of crap software that required always online connectivity. Back when only 20% of Americans had broadband. Steam didn't begin life as a storefront, but instead it began as a place to connect to other players and download patches. It wasn't until 2004 where Steam began to pick up Steam. Critically acclaimed FPS Half-Life 2 was released, and it was glorious. Yes, you could go into stores and buy boxed copies of Half-Life 2. They even gave you a CD and CD keys. But you had to download Steam and register your CD key with Steam to play Half-Life 2. And the people loved Half-Life 2, and so they were more than willing to register for a Steam account and register their CD keys. Also, tying the CD key with your account means you could play Half-Life 2 anywhere you logged into. Curiously enough, there was an offer for Half-Life 2 on Steam. If you bought it directly on Steam, they'd give you Counter-Strike Source for free. And there were multiple tiers of Half-Life 2. Was this the first Steam sale? It could very well be. It wasn't until 2005 when we'd see third-party games on Steam, the first of which is a forgotten indie game known as Ragdoll Kung Fu. It's an innovative little fighting game in which you would control your character with the mouse, both your movements and your attacks. Everything from your movements to attacks were physics-based, and there wasn't anything like it. And actually, to this day, there's still nothing like it. Maybe I'll try it on Steam Deck. 2006 and 2007 mostly focused on improving the storefront and selling more games. Valve also released the Orange Box in the year 2007. This included Half-Life 2, Half-Life 2 Episode 1, Half-Life 2 Episode 2, Portal, and Team Fortress 2. All of these games are a classic, but if I had to pick one true winner out of this collection, it would be Portal 1 and it's not even close. 2008 was the beginning of Steam Cloud. Yes, Steam Cloud back then was the same as it is now. It synchronizes your saves, keybinds, settings, and all of that other good stuff between multiple different computers. Steam Cloud was way ahead of its time. Back then, there was no cloud backups for any consoles whatsoever. The first product to release with Steam Cloud was Left 4 Dead, and even back then, it was just advertised as just working. To be honest, I couldn't tell you how Steam Cloud worked back then, but I can tell you right now, Steam Cloud works great. It literally does what it's supposed to. The only unfortunate thing about this system is that not every game supports Steam Cloud, which is understandable given that some games have massive save files. 2009 was the year Steam grew substantially, over 205%. 2009 was also the first year we've ever had a Steam sale. It was the Steam Holiday Sale. According to some data that I've read, 2009 Steam sales weren't all that impressive given that they were mostly older titles. But, you know, it's a start. Left 4 Dead 2 was also released in 2009 as well. 2010 was the year Steam for Mac OS was released, and it came with a bunch of games too. Steam on Mac is still available, though I don't really know how it works given that Mac switched over to Apple Silicon. Does it work? 2011 introduced a lot of things. This was the year Valve introduced Steam Guard, their two-factor authentication system. It's simple, you get a code sent to your email and then you put the code in and you can log in successfully. Neat. This is also the year I made my permanent Steam account. I've had a Steam account before, but honestly I forgot the passwords, and I've also never bought any games, so there's that too. 2011 was also the year Steam Workshop was introduced. For the games that did support Steam Workshop, it made modding games a lot simpler. It was just one click and the mods downloaded and applied to your game automatically. Your mod list would also be synced between computers as well. It was also the year TF2 went free to play, and it was the first time I've played Team Fortress 2, and it was a great time. It was also the year Portal 2 was released, and you can still buy Portal 2 to this day. It's still an excellent title. 2012 is possibly the most important year in all of Steam. Steam Greenlight was introduced, allowing users to vote on what games should be released on Steam. Back then, it was very difficult to get your game released on Steam. Steam had a typical approval process, and it was a painful one. Gabe Newell himself famously said that this was a bottleneck. On paper, Steam Greenlight sounds like the perfect solution. 
users vote for what games they want to come to Steam. But this isn't really something you should trust the users with, not to mention it was rife with exploitation. And the amount of submissions there were meant that some games just wouldn't get noticed, ever. So Valve did away with that system, and replaced it with something else. But we'll get to that later down the line. This was also the year Valve introduced the Steam Marketplace. Valve's games had a key and crate system. You would buy keys to open up crates and you'd get random loot. Counter-Strike Global Offensive was also released this year, so this was a perfect time to showcase this new market system. Players could buy and sell goodies from one another, and some of them were really expensive. They also expanded upon this by letting you trade trading cards and other goodies as well. There's also some major controversy surrounding your ability to trade with other players, but I'm not qualified to talk about that stuff. 2012 was also the year Windows 8 came out, and it represents a shift in Valve's philosophy towards operating systems. Gabe Newell was very concerned about what Windows 8 represented. Gabe Newell was very concerned that this newly introduced Windows Store would be the equivalent of Apple's walled garden, but in Windows instead. Let's talk about getting new apps in the App Store. Officially speaking, in order to get new apps on your iPhone, you have to go to the App Store and download the apps, and Apple controls that entire process the approval process, and they even get a cut of the profits as well. Gabe Newell also said this interesting tidbit as well. We want to make it as easy as possible for the 2,500 games on Steam to run on Linux as well. It's a hedging strategy. This was the first time Linux was ever mentioned, and you'll see why this is important later. 2013 represents the start of something new. First and foremost, it introduced Big Picture Mode, which was a console-ized interface. The interface was optimized for controller, unlike, you know, the normal Steam interface. It's useful, and it's functional, but it's kind of just meh. 2013 also introduced user reviews. You know the thumbs up and thumbs down system that you're all accustomed to now? That was released back then. It's more or less the same system we have now. 2013 was also the year Steam came out on Linux. As far as I'm aware, Valve only really supported Ubuntu first. But you know how Linux users are. They'll get Steam working on anything. Valve also released SteamOS 1.0. SteamOS was a consoleized OS that can be installed on any computer. But of course, the main caveat is you could only play Linux titles. SteamOS had a unique feature back then though. You could stream games from your Windows PC to whatever PC was running SteamOS. Nowadays, this isn't anything special, but back then, it was the only operating system that supported that. It was also the year Dota 2 came out. Dota 2 is still one of the most popular games on Steam that I've never played. 2014 was the year the Discovery update was released. It was a change not only in the design of the website, but also the design language of Steam itself. It introduced a recommendation engine, oftentimes recommending games for you. You want to know what I think about the Discovery queue? I think it sucks. The Discovery queue is supposed to recommend games based on specific criteria. Sometimes it's based on games you like, other times it's based on arbitrary tags, like if the game is single player or multiplayer or, you know, multiplayer sci-fi. And sometimes games will be recommended just because it's popular. Sometimes it works, sometimes you'll find games that are similar to games you love and other times it recommends games just arbitrarily. Also introduced were Steam Curators. These are organizations that put up recommendations for games based on their own criteria. Some do legit 200 character game reviews, and others are just memes. Which by the way, I do have my own Steam Curator. I recommend games based on whether or not they work on Steam Deck, as well as, you know, if the games are any good. There's a link in the description down below if you want to check it out. 2014 also introduced Steam Broadcasting. I have never met a single person in my life that's ever broadcasted anything on Steam Broadcast. It's more or less an alternative to Twitch. 2015 was the year Steam Machines arrived. Multiple different manufacturers made branded Steam Machines, but ultimately, none of them were really a success. Steam Machines were underpowered and overpriced. Not to mention, Valve never actually made a definitive Steam Machine. Steam Machines also came with SteamOS pre-installed, and back then you could only play native Linux titles on SteamOS. Back then, Valve had a very different strategy for Linux. They've tried courting major AAA developers. Games like Street Fighter V and and The Witcher 3 were announced with SteamOS ports, but those native Linux ports never came to fruition. The Steam machines were a catastrophic failure. A much less catastrophic failure were the Steam controllers. The Steam controller was a love it or hate it kind of deal. 
I got it when I was still in college. I showed it to all of my college buddies and they hated the Steam controller. It was weird, it was alien, it was foreign. Where's the right stick? Where's the D-pad? What's with the haptics? The Steam controller, in my opinion, was way ahead of its time. It also coincided with the release of Steam Input. That said, Steam Input back then was very basic. Outside of remapping your controls, there really wasn't much Steam Input did. It wasn't until many updates later that Steam Input became the powerhouse it is today. Such updates included the ability to use your built-in gyro for your Steam controller, as well as the ability to create menus known as touch menus, or radial menus, and many, many more. These updates also included the ability to use other controllers with Steam input, such as the DualShock 4. Ultimately though, the Steam controller was discontinued in 2019, but there's still very much a dedicated hardcore Steam controller community. Here's to hoping we get a Steam controller 2 at some point, because I'm tired of waiting. 2015 was also the year the Steam Link came out. It was a tiny little box that streamed games from your PC to your TV or whatever screen you hooked up to. The Steam Link was way ahead of its time, and many outlets recommended you buy the Steam Link instead of buying a Steam machine for your living room, especially if you had a pre-existing gaming PC. It was only $50, and it was pretty simple to set up. That said, they don't make Steam Links anymore. Steam Link now exists as an app that you can download on most smart TVs or, you know, smart dongles. You can even download it on a Raspberry Pi. You can even download it on your phone and play PC games on your phone via streaming, which is pretty cool. I've done that before. In 2016, Valve made a VR section in Steam. This was also when Valve released their first VR headset, the HTC Vive. 2016 was also when they introduced the Steam Awards, an entirely community-based awards show. Players would nominate games for multiple different categories, whether they've played them or not, and then they would vote on games, and whoever got the most votes won. It's fairly simple. That said, the system was not flawless whatsoever. For starters, you could vote for games that weren't even released in that year, causing some games to win multiple times throughout the years. It's not a bad thing per se, but it's contrary to most award show where they only focus on games released that year. This was also the year Valve started to accept Bitcoin as a form of payment. Valve was one of the first major companies to support Bitcoin payments. But of course, Bitcoin support wouldn't last for long as it would be dropped off towards the end of 2017. Valve claims that this is due to the volatility in the Bitcoin market, not to mention increasing in processing fees. It used to cost them 20 cents and now it costs them $20 to process Bitcoin transactions. They they said they'll reevaluate whether or not Bitcoin makes sense for Steam, but honestly, I doubt cryptocurrency will ever make sense for Steam. Another major change is that the greenlight system introduced in 2012 is now no more, instead replaced with a different system instead. Steam Direct allowed any developer to publish their games on Steam for a fee. The fee isn't a huge deal for legitimate developers as well as legitimate hardworking indie devs. Furthermore, once you hit $1,000 worth of sales, Valve will give you back your $100. The fee serves to punish those who just buy Unity asset flips and try to sell them on Steam. Did it totally eliminate asset flips? No, it didn't. But it certainly reduced the number of asset flips you'd see on Steam. 2018 was yet another big year for Steam. This was the year Valve allowed adult games on Steam. Why did Valve allow adult games on Steam? Well, as it turns out, there's an official answer. So we ended up going back to one of the principles in the forefront of our minds when we started Steam, and more recently as we worked on Steam Direct to open up the store to many more developers. Valve shouldn't be the ones deciding this. If you're a player, we shouldn't be choosing for you what content you can or can't buy. If you're a developer, we shouldn't be choosing what content you're allowed to create. Those choices should be yours to make. Our role should be to provide systems and tools to support your efforts to make these choices for yourself, and to help you do it in a way that makes you feel comfortable. With that principle in mind, we've decided that the right approach is to allow everything onto the Steam store, except for things that we decide are illegal, or straight up trolling. Taking this approach allows us to focus less on trying to police what should be on Steam, and more on building those tools to give people control over what kinds of content they see. Wow, that was a lot. So Valve has decided. Nothing explicitly illegal and nothing considered straight up trolling. But the big question is, what does Valve consider trolling? Because if this isn't trolling, then I don't know what trolling is. But here's a dirty little secret. See, adult games have always been on Steam, but in censored form and you would have to go off of Steam to get patches to unlock the goodies, so to speak. 
that extra step is no longer necessary. For an extra $10, you can buy the DLC for Nekopara on Steam. This was also the year Artifact came out, and Artifact was Valve's biggest commercial failure in terms of games. They even got Richard Garfield, the main designer from Magic the Gathering, to work on this game, and it still failed. It's pretty clear the core Valve audience doesn't want more Dota stuff, they want more Half-Life stuff. But all of this other stuff is discounting from the real achievement that happened this year as well. Because this was the year Proton was introduced as well. If you have a Steam Deck and you're playing games on SteamOS on your Steam Deck, you should be thankful for Proton. Proton is a compatibility layer designed to play Windows titles on Linux. If you recall, Valve's original strategy for SteamOS was to court developers into porting games to Linux, which as you can tell, didn't work out. This was the turning point for Valve's Linux endeavors. Proton was baked directly into Steam, meaning that there was little hassle in trying to get games to work. That said, when Proton initially released, Valve had only tested out 27 different titles. Games like Beat Saber, Doki Doki Literature Club, Doom, Fallout Shelter, Final Fantasy VI, Near Automata, and Tekken 7, and a couple of others that I can't remember off the top of my head. While these were the only officially supported titles, Valve lets you test out Proton with basically anything in your Steam library. Yes, your mileage would vary, but this was such a big deal in the Linux gaming community. So big, in fact, that someone created a website called ProtonDB, which is a great resource for figuring out if games work on Linux or Steam Deck. Reports are often community-based, and they tell you whether or not games work, or if games need tweaks, or if they just don't work. 2019 changed the Steam library. It used to look like this, and now it looks like this. I prefer the new design, but I can see why some prefer the old design. This was also the year the Valve Index was released. At the time, the Valve Index was the most bougie VR headset that you could buy, which is saying a lot given that, you know, VR headsets were already kind of expensive. But according to many reviews, it provided the best VR experience, period. I kind of want to get one one day, but only when they're on a very deep discount. 2020 introduced Steam Points and the Steam Points Store. When you buy things on Steam, you get Steam Points, and you can spend those Steam Points on cosmetics for your profile. You can spend your Steam Points on profile backgrounds, avatars, avatar frames, game-specific profile things for your Steam profile, and many more. This is the year where soundtracks were officially decoupled from the DLC system. Soundtracks used to be considered DLC in the Steam system, and as such, you had to own the game to own the soundtrack as well. This is no longer the case. You can now buy soundtracks to games you don't even own. 2020 was also the year the world changed, and so did Valve. Valve experienced record-breaking numbers. Not surprising because everyone was stuck at home, right? 2020 also introduced the Steam Game Festival. It's a celebration of upcoming games. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, that's because this was the precursor to the Steam Next Fest. The Steam Game Festival is more or less the same thing. It's a celebration of upcoming games, with multiple different demos to try out. This was a revolutionary event for players. They could discover new games, and try out new games without committing to buying the games first. There were a ton of demos out there that you could try. And ultimately, I discovered a lot of great games through the Steam Next Fest. A lot of games I probably wouldn't have played otherwise. These Next Fests are always my favorite events in Steam, and there's one coming up really soon, which I'll talk about later. Also released this year was Half-Life Alex. Half-Life Alex is a new entry in the Half-Life series, but the real kicker is that it's VR exclusive. It's also considered by many to be the best dang VR game ever made. That said, Half-Life Alex does have a no VR mod, but honestly that kind of seems like it defeats the purpose. 2021 was the year our lives changed. Forever. This was the year the Steam Deck was announced to us all. I remember that day like it was yesterday. It was the day Nintendo also unveiled their Nintendo Switch OLED. And Valve announces this thing. Was it a stroke of genius or was it just pure luck? I don't know, but Valve certainly got my attention. Yes, portable PCs have existed before, but this was the first one that really grabbed my attention. It could play AAA titles surprisingly well, even games like Cyberpunk which were known for running like crap on most PCs. I wanted it now, and I knew how to showcase the endless possibilities this device had. Valve also released Steam Remote Play together this year. Essentially, if a game supported it, you could play a local multiplayer game over the internet with your friend. All you would have to do is stream your game to them, and they would be playing as if they were like right beside you. I really, really like this feature. You should give it a shot if you've got any friends to play with. Now comes the year 2022, the year the Steam Deck was released. I gotta tell you, it was perfect.
perfect. Everything, down to the last minute details. Okay, maybe that was a bit of an exaggeration, but the point is that the Steam Deck was amazing. It came out, I loved the thing, even despite all of its bugs and stuff. It also got a ton of updates that made it more stable and it just made it a better device altogether. I'm not going to give you every detail because honestly that would be too long of a video. 2022 also concluded with a brand new Steam feature called the Steam Replay. It's a total recap of your year of playing video games. The 2022 edition showcased your most played games as well as all of the games you've played, any new games you've tried out, playtests, yada yada yada. There's a lot of details and each person has their own unique Steam Replay. Go check yours out. There isn't a whole lot we can talk about because, well, it's still 2023. Many people think that Steam's been stagnating because it's been at the top. It's the top of the food chain. It's the biggest PC storefront. I mean, what PC is complete without Steam installed, right? But throughout the years, Steam has been growing. Rest assured, Valve has not rest on their laurels, not one bit. Steam is constantly improving, introducing new features and new fun things to do outside of while well, playing games. Steam went from being this crappy little program that no one wanted to install to being a must-have for any PC gamer. The crazy thing is that despite Valve's dominance in the market, Valve hasn't really done anything monopolistic. It didn't take Valve that long to overtake the PC gaming market, but Valve also started from scratch. No one had made anything like Steam before. The difference between this and say the Epic Game Store is that the Epic Game Store had Steam to look to. I'm not saying Epic should have copied Valve wholesale with all of the features, but what I am saying is they could have done that and no one would have been upset. And they would have had a feature complete storefront. What is worth mentioning is that Valve has spent over 10 years trying to get Steam and all of the games to work properly on Linux, and for the most part they've succeeded. Most games on Steam work as expected, and even if they don't work out of the box, there are some fixes you can implement. And Valve has made it easy for games running the most common anti-cheat software to get their games working on Linux, you know, provided the developers actually care. There are also developers out there that actively try out their games on Steam Deck to see if they work. And ultimately, the Steam Deck is a culmination of everything Valve has learned, from the hardware to the software to how developers interact with a foreign operating system. And I think Valve has succeeded. The big question though is, what does the future hold in store for Valve and Steam? What'll happen come Steam's 25th anniversary, or their 30th anniversary, or their 40th anniversary, or whatever? It's hard to say what'll happen in 10 years, but hopefully if I'm still doing this YouTube stuff in 10 years, I might make another video. Yeah, Steam's 30th birthday. That has a nice ring to it. If you like this video, be sure to press the thumbs up button and spread the good gospel of high tech low life. And if you want to see more high tech low life, be sure to subscribe and press the bell icon for notifications. And for you enlightened individuals, be sure to join my Discord server. And if you wish to support high tech low life, be sure to check out our Patreon page. Links in the description down below.